Hello everybody! It's Mrs. Brixen. I'm here and I'm live. Uh, oh my gosh, yesterday was so much fun. We're gonna wait a little bit. We're gonna see who is all watching. Hello, hello. Hi. Let's see who's watching. Let's see if we can get anybody on here. I'm starting a little bit early just so that I can get everybody on. Oh! We've got Michelle and Grace. Oh, Sally Wolf. Yes. Hey, Jed. Hi. Oh, yes. Here we see the rats. Oh, my gosh. Everyone's coming on. Phillips. Oh, Michelle Skirvin. Yes. Hello, guys. I think the Rath boys are upstairs in the third grade room right now. I think they should come down and say hi to me. So I think they're upstairs. They should, I think I heard them come in. <laughs> oh, hello, Lucy. Lucy Shuleen is a part of it. Caden is one of my babies from before, and he is a sophomore. And so you have to say hi to him, do our special handshakes. <gasps> hi from Grace. Hi from Grace Duffy. We got more and more people coming on. <laughs> oh, it was so much fun yesterday um, connecting with people. And it's great if you want to connect with other people. <gasps> Nolan just said hi, Nolan Phillip. Hi, Mrs. Brixen from Nolan. Mrs. Dahlman. Oh, and Mrs. Zare. I saw Mrs. Zare earlier today. I'm not sure if she's still in the building or not. Yep. And Rico. We have Rico. Yes, we got Chico and Sophia, maybe. Which reminds me. Okay, so today um, I stopped by, had an early lunch at um, the Wired Bean and went through the drive through And I cannot stress this enough, you guys. It is so, so important that we help out our local businesses, um, especially places like, you know, restaurants, um, shops, you know, things like that, that they rely upon people coming in. McDonald's, they'll, they're going to be fine. I'm not worried about them. Um, Walmart, they're going to be fine. Not worried about them. But you know what? Go to the line on 59, right? Go, you know, and, and we have Sophie... <gasps> With Sophia and Chico, uh, Sophia and Chico, their parents own it. And we have some visitors because they heard me. Who is that? Come over here. Come over here. Say hi to everybody. Hi. hi. Yes. And take a look. Hold on. I'm going to go like this. Here. Oh, take a look here. You can read the comments. We have hi from the Dolman boys. They're above. Are they upstairs? Yeah. Well, calm down. Goodness gracious. Okay. This Ellie, Ellie Holton is here. Oh, hi, Isaac. Hey, Isaac P. <laughs> hi, Isaac P. <Peterson. laughs> so I'm just, this. hi, Grace from Isaac P. Hi, Isaac R. And Sam. Yay. See, there's your friend. They can still see you. I hear footy prints from upstairs because they're directly above. Let's see if we can get some other kids in here. Oh, Kenzie and Jordan. Hello, Gunner. Gunner. Hi, Isaac R. from Grace. Hey, Gunner. Yeah. <laughs> Hi from Kendall. You can get you use. Oh, wait a minute. We have some other people. Shift over here. Come here. Take a look. Who's this? Who's that? Is your, are your other brothers upstairs? Um, they're microwaving pancakes. They're microwaving pancakes. They're microwaving pancakes. Do you want to say hi? Oh, let, take a look here. He has a big smile on his face. See? Okay. <laughs> Isaac Philip has a big smile on his face. Hi from Mackenzie. Hi, Isaac and Sam. Oh, hold on. Scoot back so they can see your face. Come here. <laughs> All right. We have Carter. Yes, we have Carter Dahlman, whose mom's upstairs. You guys, we have the best teachers. Seriously. Just looking at some of the things that I've been seeing, what they've been sending you, and they've been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, should I start? Should I start my reading? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you guys gonna go up and listen? Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. Oh, <sighs> my heart is full. I can't handle it. Oh my gosh. Oh, this is great. <laughs> okay, you guys. I need a drum roll. If you've seen the comments, take a look here. Take a look. Ellie Holton got her back brace off. Her back brace is off. Yay. All the way back from Catholic Schools Week. So, oh my gosh, Ellie, I'm giving you a very gentle hug. Gentle, gentle hug. Uh, I'm, 
seriously oh my gosh you guys my heart is full so let's get started let's get started so we have to start with a little dance okay sing along Also saw one of my notifications. Hi from Nora. Hi, let's see. I think I saw this. Hi from Nora. That was another one. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's begin. But hey, it's great to see you today. We're going to continue the story of the Herdmans. Remember the best school year ever. Remember, if for some reason um, you have missed any of this, please go to. It's, this is on YouTube. This is a playlist that will have all of my um, videos on there. It's really easy. Notice the back part is STBBWMB, St. Bernard's Book with Mrs. Brixen. Um, but it has to be case sensitive. So if it's a capital letter, it has to be capital. If it's a small letter, it has to be small. And uh, that's in case you miss it. And I loved the, the uh, pictures that you had sent to me. And so what I want to do, and I got this idea from Mrs. DeMars, who I saw today. Um, she said that her first assignment for her fourth and fifth grade students was for them to send a picture of their little school desk, their workspace, you know, wherever you guys have set up, that you're gonna designate, this is my school spot. This is your assignment. I want you to send me, maybe in the comments, take a picture of your spot that you, you're going to set up and have ready to go for school. Has your supplies, if there's some electronics, you know, I don't know, maybe there, you know, someplace that you can really focus. So that's your assignment today. Alrighty. When last we heard from the Herdmans, we were just introduced to them. And we learned, now this main character is Beth Bradley, not Beth Zare, Beth Bradley and her little brother Charlie, and they had this family called the Herdmans who were in their school, okay? And there were six of them, and I'm trying to find, I'm just trying to list off their names really quick. Woo! Um, Ralph, Imogene, Leroy, Claude, Ollie, and Gladys, and there were one per class, and they were just crazy kids. Today, um, I'm going to read you two chapters because they're really short and they're just kind of individual stories. So even if you weren't, if you didn't listen to yesterday, that's okay. Got to start. Wired bean, iced tea. <clears throat> Here we go. Got to get comfortable. Oh, notice I got my shirt. Huh? That was from Read Cross America Day. Okay. <clears throat> A lot of people like Alice Wendelkin's mother thought the Herdmans ought to be in jail. Kids are not, but I knew that wouldn't happen. Our jail has just two cells in the basement of the town hall, and the Herdmans aren't allowed in the tall town hall anymore since Gladys and Ollie put all the frogs in the drinking fountain there. They were little tiny frogs, and Miss Farley, the town clerk, drank two or three of them off of the top of the bubbler by mistake. She didn't have her glasses on, she said. She didn't see them until somebody hollered, Evelyn, stop! You're drinking frogs! Miss Farley was hysterical. She said she could feel them jerking and jumping up and down her windpipe. But even so, she chased Gladys and Ollie all around the block, and she said if she ever caught any herdmans inside the town hall again, she would put on roller skates and run them out of town so fast their heels would smoke. Of course, they didn't care. Why'd you eat our frogs anyway, Gladys said. It's not our fault she ate our frogs. She'll get warts 
in her stomach where she can't scratch them. Warts don't itch, Alice Wendelkin told her. These will, Gladys said. We caught them in the frog patches in the poison ivy. The town hall wasn't the only place in town where the herdmans weren't allowed to get a drink of water or go to the bathroom or call their mother or anything. They also weren't allowed in the drugstore or the movie theater or the A&P or the table. They used to be allowed in the post office. That didn't last. Somebody got a hold of all of their school pictures and put them up right next to the wanted posters. And it seemed so natural for them to be there, nobody noticed until Ollie Herdman went up and asked the postmaster, Mr. Blair, how much money can I get from my brother Claude? I don't know what you mean, Mr. Blair said. Some of the people are worth $500, Ollie said. How much can I get for Claude? So Mr. Blair went to see what he was talking about, and sure enough, there were the Herdmans, right up there with the bank robbers and the mad bombers and all. Mr. Blair had a fit. How did these pictures get up here? He said, did you put these pictures up here? Ollie said, no, it's a big surprise to him. Well, it's a big surprise to me, too, Mr. Blair said, but I can tell you that the FBI is not going to pay you or anything for Claude or any of the rest of you either. How did you happen to pick Claude? Because he's the one I got, Ollie said. Mr. Blair said he didn't like the sound of that. I figure he probably had Claude tied to a tree somewhere. So he mentioned it to the policeman on the corner. And the policeman said he better go investigate, because with the herdmans, you never could tell. He didn't have to go far. There was a big crowd of people and a lot of commotion halfway down the block. And sure enough, Ollie had shut Claude up in the men's room of the Seneca station. That's a gas station. So when the policeman got there, Claude was banging on the door and hollering for somebody to let him out. And there was a whole big family from South Dakota wanting to get in. The mother said they had driven almost 150 miles looking for a Seneca station because they were the cleanest. But what good was clean if you couldn't get in? I gave the keys to one of the herdmans, the manager said, and he went off with it. I should have my head examined. But you don't need a key to get out, the policeman said. Why doesn't Claude just open the door? I can't, Claude said. The door's stuck. Ollie claimed later that he didn't have anything to do with that, and even planned to shut up Claude in the men's room or anywhere else. But when the door jammed shut, he went off to get help, and that was when he saw the pictures at the police office. You were going to the police office? The post office? The manager asked. I was going to get my sister, Imogene. And she was at the post office? No, Ollie said. She wasn't there. That was typical Herdman. There was a lie in it somewhere, but you couldn't put your finger on it. Of course, that was later. In the meantime, Mr. Blair and the Santa Coast station manager had to get the fire department to break open the door and get Claude out. By that time, the South Dakota people had left, and a lot of other people who wanted gas got tired of waiting. And somebody, and in the excitement, somebody walked off with two cans of motor oil and a wrench. Herdman's probably, but nobody could prove it, just like nobody could prove that all he really meant to hand Claude over to the FBI for money. So then, the Herdmans weren't allowed in the post office or the Seneca station, and they got thrown out of the new laundromat the very day it opened. Okay, here comes a fun part. I need a drink. Oh, look at all these cool comments. When do we go back to school? I have no idea, honey. Just listen to the news. Oh, okay. Gosh. Um, <clears throat> here we go. We're talking about the new laundromat. They planned to wash their cat in one of the machines. But they didn't know it was going to cost money. 
So they just dropped him in and went off to locate some quarters. Of course, the cat didn't like the washing machine, and it made so much noise, hissing, spitting, scratching, ring, 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 that the manager, Mr. Cleveland, went to go see what was wrong. I thought it was a short circuit, he said, or a lost connection, something electrical. He said, that's what kind of noise it was. People said it looked electrical, all right. When he opened the lid, the cat shot out with its tail and ears and his hair all standing straight up. It skittered around the tops of the machines and clawed through everybody's laundry baskets and knocked over big boxes of soap and bottles of bleach and a big basket of flowers that said, good luck to the laundromat. Finally, someone opened the door and the last they saw of the cat, it was roaring down the street, all tangled up in a bed cloth, tablecloth. Of course. The laundromat was a mess, and all the customers were mad and couldn't find their clothes and wanted their money back for the stuff the cat had spilled. Pretty soon, people began to sneeze <coughs> from all the cat hair <coughs> and soap powder <coughs> in the air. And one lady broke out in big red blotches all over because she was allergic to cats. Mr. Cleveland sent everyone outdoors until things settled down. But things didn't settle down. Santoro's Pizza Parlor was across the street. And when Mr. Santoro saw all these people coming out of the laundromat, sneezing and coughing and choking, he yelled, what's up the matter? Is it a fire? Somebody yelled back, no, cat hair. But Mr. Santoro thought they said, bad air. He figured there was something wrong with the new plumbing connections, maybe a gas leak. And he ran to the top of the street to warn people away in case of an explosion. Some of the people he warned away were the Herdmans, Imogene and Ralph and Leroy, on their way back with 50 cents for the washing machine. You children get away from here, he said. The laundromat, it may explode. I guess they were pretty surprised. They probably figured the cat did it, but they didn't know how. They also probably figured that if the cat was smart enough to burrow up a laundromat, it was smart enough to get away. So they just left. Mr. Santoro called the fire department too, and they came right away. Of course, there wasn't any fire, and there wasn't any gas leak. And by that time, there wasn't any cat, and there weren't any herdmans either. Just a lot of angry customers and a reporter from the newspaper who went around interviewing everybody. Most of the people didn't even know what had happened because it happened so fast. So the newspaper story was pretty mysterious. <clears throat> Laundromat opening marred by unusual disturbance, it said. Firemen respond to anonymous alarm. Customers describe wild animal. My father said at least they got that part right. Mr. Cleveland had to clean up the mess and replace everybody's stuff and pay for the blotched up lady to get an allergy shot. So he was pretty mad because someone called him anonymous. And of course the firemen were mad because they knew the herdmans did it, whatever it was. In the meantime, the herdmans were home waiting for their cat to show up. The cat, crazier than usual because it was all wrapped up in a tablecloth, was tearing all over town, yelling, spitting, and scratching, and anything that got in its way. It ran in the barber shop and streaked up one side of the chair where Mr. Perry was shaving someone. All of a sudden, Mr. Perry said, there was a cat, so I lathered up the cat by mistake. I missed my customer, and I lathered up the cat. Then the cat ran through the lobby of the movie theater, and he picked up some popcorn. And by that time, you can tell what it had ever been. It finally clawed its way up a tree in front of the library. And the librarian, Miss Grabner, called the fire department to come and get it down. I think it's a cat, she said, and it looks like it's been through a war. No, the fire chief, chief said, it's been through a washing machine. And as far as I'm concerned, it can stay in that tree until the middle of next year. Of course, Miss Grabner was mad about that. The only people who weren't mad were the Herdmans, because when the cat finally came home, it was all clean and fluffy from the shaving lather. 
and that's what they wanted in the first place. So that was chapter two. Oh, I just love looking at all these comments. Oh, we got an Aurora. Yes. I saw Blomkers up here earlier. We're going to go to chapter three because they're both two short chapters. Okie doke. <clears throat> Naturally, my mother wasn't too crazy about the Herdman since they were always mopping up the floor with Charlie. But she had too much to do, she said, to spend time complaining about that. them. She would leave that to Alice Wendelkin's mother, who was so good at it. Mrs. Wendelkin complained about them all the time to everybody. It was her second favorite subject. Besides, how smart Alice was, and how pretty, and how talented, and how it would all go to waste if Gladys Herdman bit her to death. Every time you turned around, Mrs. Wendelkin was volunteering Alice to be the star of something, the main fairy, or the head elf, or the clean up our streets poster girl. And when the Chamber of Commerce brought a resp pot, a respirator, for the hospital, they put a picture of it in the paper, and sure enough, there was Alice, hooked up to the respirator. Mrs. Wendelkin said she didn't have anything to do with that. The photographer just looked around and said, I wonder if that pretty little girl would be willing to pose for our respirator. But nobody believed her. Alice didn't get any applause for this either, but she carried the picture around anyways and showed it to everyone who would hold still. She showed it to Imogene. And at recess, and Imogene took one look and hollered, Get away from me! Don't touch me! Whatever you got, I don't want! Which brought the school nurse in a hurry in case Alice had smallpox or something. Or maybe coronavirus. Okay. It emptied the playground in a hurry, too. Everybody figured that if it was something Imogene Herdman was scared to catch, it would wipe out the rest of us, because ordinary germs didn't even slow the Herdmans down. They never got mumps or pink eye or colds or stomach aches or anything. A snake once bit Leroy Herdman, and Leroy's legs swelled up a little bit, but that was all. The snake died. Leroy brought it to school, and he tied it all up and down the light cord in the teacher's supply closet. You know, it's kind of like the closet that we have at St. Bernard's up at the top on, across from the second grade room. Think of that. And later, the kindergarten teacher, Miss Newman, came in and pulled the cord. She had all the day's helpers with her. Six kindergarten kids carrying pots of red finger paint. And when Miss Newman screamed, they all dropped their pots and finger paint flew all over the place. And then somebody upset two big boxes of chalk and they all trampled around in that. And when the janitor heard the racket and opened the door, he looked, took one look and went straight to get the principal. He said, there had been some sort of terrible accident and the supply closet was full of bloody people, all cut up and screaming with pain. By the time the principal got there, Miss Newman had pulled herself together and was herding little kids down the hall to the washroom. And then the recess bell rang. So, the hall was full of kids. The teachers calling to Miss Newman, what happened, what happened? And the principal said, move along, move along, nothing to see here. And of course, there was plenty to see. The whole thing looked like a big disaster we had just read about in, the, in history called the Children's Massacre. In all the commotion, Leroy Herdman just walked into the supply closet, untied his snake, put it in his pocket, and walked out again. When we got back from recess, the principal and Miss Newman and the janitor and the boys' basketball coach were all crawling around the floor of the supply closet. And Miss Newman was saying, I tell you, there was a snake crawling up the light cord. Of course, they never did find it, because nobody looked in Leroy's pocket. I couldn't understand why the snake died and Leroy didn't. But when I asked my father, he said that Leroy probably stretched his story. A snake bit him, my father said, and then he found a different snake that was already dead. That's what I think. My mother said she bet it wasn't a snake at all, that Leroy just tied a whole bunch of poor worms together. 
But I decided that if Leroy was telling the truth for the first time in his life, the snake was perfectly healthy, bit Leroy, and immediately died. So maybe Mrs. Wendelkin wasn't far wrong to pour iodine all over Alice. And maybe Alice should just shut up about this treatment and just be glad that she wasn't dead like the snake. Two or three days later, Leroy stuck the snake into the third grade pencil sharpener tail first. And the teacher, Mrs. Rath, went all to pieces too. It was bad enough, she said, to <laughs> hold on a second. Get in here. We have a special guest. Hello. <laughs> We were just talking about third grade teacher. That was perfect timing. <laughs> would you like it if there was a snake in your pencil sharpener? I would not. She would not like that. Okay. Special guest star, Mrs. Rapp. Okay. I just lost it. <laughs> oh, uh, it was bad enough, she said, to find a snake in the pencil sharpener, but then she almost sharpened it by mistake. The snake was pretty worn out by then, so they threw it away. But nobody in the third grade, grade would go near the pencil sharpener for the rest of the week. My mother's friend, Miss Phillips. Oh, we have a Phillips family, remember? Yeah, I think they're watching. There's a Phillips in here. My mother's friend, Miss Phillips, worked for the welfare department. And one of her jobs was to check up on the herdmans. So mother told her about the snake bite in case Leroy should get some sort of shot for it. But Miss Phillips said that she didn't know of any shot that would benefit Leroy. And anyway, her sympathies were with the snake. I went once to the garage where those kids live, she said, but I never got inside, and I barely got out of the yard alive. It was full of rocks and poison ivy and torn up bicycles and pieces of cars and great big holes they dug. I fell in one of those holes, and a cat jumped on me from out of the window. Good thing I had a hat on or I'd be bald. Now, I just drive past that place once a month, and if they haven't managed to blow it up or burn it down, I figure they're all right. But a snake bite, Mother said. Don't you think that's unusual? I certainly do, Miss Phillips said. It's the first time some, some, <laughs> it's the first time something bit one of them instead of the other way around. The whole thing got into the newspaper. Reptile found in Woodrow Wilson School, the article said. Teachers and students alarmed. That probably met Miss, meant Miss Newman and all the kindergarten kids. Parents seek action. Probably meant Mrs. Wendelkin seeking to get the herdmans expelled or arrested or something. School official inspects premises. It was Mr. Crabtree, the principal, who stuck his head in the third grade room and said, if one more snake showed up anywhere, he would personally kill it, skin it, cook it, and feed it to whoever was responsible. I don't know whether that would have scared Leroy or not, but it didn't matter anyhow, because he wasn't there. Imogene said he stayed home to bury the snake, and she had this messy, scribbled up note that said, Leroy is absent at funeral. I'm sorry to hear that, Imogene, the teacher said. Was it a member of your family? Why aren't you at the funeral? It was a friend of Leroy's, Imogene said. I didn't like him. Mrs. Wendelkin was mad because the newspaper article didn't say it was Leroy Herdman's snake that caused all this trouble. And she was mad at the principal because he wouldn't say so either. I can't prove who the snake belonged to, Mr. Crabtree said. And even if I could, why would I? It wasn't a boa constrictor, you know. It was dead to begin with. But I guess Mrs. Wendelkin was really out to nail Leroy, and she wouldn't give up. Of course it was Leroy's snake. Everybody knows it was Leroy's snake. Who else would bury it? Why would Leroy Herdman bury somebody else's snake? I don't know. Mr. Crabtree was fed up with the snake and Leroy Herdman, and Mrs. Wendelkin, too. But if he did bury a snake for someone else, it's the first cooperative thing he's ever done in his life. And I just think we ought to drop the whole subject. 
don't you? That probably would have been the end of it, except that Mrs. Wendelkin described this conversation to my mother, who described it to Miss Phillips. Then Miss Phillips went to school and told Mr. Crabtree that she had a plan to civilize the herdmen's, or at least one of them. It's about the snake, she said, but Mr. Crabtree wouldn't say any more. Just, I'll do it, he said. I don't even care what is it you want, just so I don't have to hear any more about that snake. So, Leroy got named Good School Citizen of the Month. We have another guest star. Who is that? It's Mr. Kataska. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Good, 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 good. Sorry to interrupt the phone right No, 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 you had to come up and see. We have all these great guest stars today. That's oh, so good. Awesome. I know, I know. See you later. It's so great to see everybody. Okay, uh, Leroy got named Good School Citizen of the Month for an Act of Kindness, the award read. Of course, this is one big surprise to everybody, especially Leroy, and it nearly killed Alice Wendelkin, who had piled up more good deeds and good grades and extra credit projects and perfect attendance records than anybody else in the whole history of the Woodrow Wilson School and expected to be the good school citizen of the month for the rest of her life. Nobody could figure out what kind thing Leroy had done, but Miss Phillips told my mother. He buried a snake, mother said. That's it? That's it, Miss Phillips said. Well, I guess if you were the snake, you might call it an act of kindness. Uh, I don't understand. It's just thought that he might decide to live up to the honor, Miss Phillips explained. He might be a changed person. Mother said she wouldn't count on it. He probably doesn't even know what he did. He didn't even do it, Charlie said, told her. Imogene just thought he did. Nobody buried the snake. The janitor threw it in the trash masher. I saw him. Well, don't tell anyone, Mother said. Mrs. Wendelkin would never shut up about it. Mother was right about Leroy. He didn't know what he did or how he got to be the good school citizen. And when Charlie wouldn't tell him, he buried Charlie up to his neck in the trash masher barrel, which would have been tough on Charlie if the janitor didn't happen to see him before he mashed up the trash. So Leroy wasn't a changed person. Unless you want to count that he only buried Charlie up to his neck instead of all the way. And with that, we're going to quit for today. So that was chapter two and three. We're, we had chapter four is for tomorrow. We're going to see what other things. Oh, we got another guest star. Hold on. We have somebody else. Who's this? Mrs. Dolman. And she, what else she have? Book orders. Book orders. Anything you want to say to the kiddos? I really miss you. She does. She does. Let's see if anybody's saying. Let's take a look. Oh my gosh, you guys have so many comments I haven't even looked at. It. Let's Isn't see. Isn't that fun to read? It is fun to read. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I gotta go hide. You gotta go hide? <laughs> Everyone's working very hard. Anyway, so I do have a joke for you. I do have a joke for you. Ready? What, what's that Nevada city where all the dentists visit? What's the Nevada city where all the dentists visit? You know what it is? It's Floss Vegas. <laughs> okay. So once you're standing up, stand up, stand up, everyone. Stand up. It's time for dance. Dance, dance time. Dance time, dance time, dance time, 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 time. Okay, in our next one. You got to keep reading. Now, there's lyrics here. Hopefully, we can turn it and you can see it. You can sing along. And we're going to have a special dance party. Oh, hold on a second. We got to get past the ads. Uh, hold on a second. Ignore that. Get past the ads. Sorry. Gotta 
keep reading Cause this book's gonna be a good book Let's see you dance, this book's take a picture gonna be a good book. Sing along Cause this book's gonna be a good, good book to read Cause this book's gonna be a good book Cause this book's gonna be a good book Cause this book's gonna be a good, good book to read And turn the page You'll never know Just what you'll find Information Or fantasy Drama and art I'll make you smart I know that you'll have a ball Turn off the TV and just read the ball Here we go, here we go everybody, jump up! Look, do you have yours? What's the title? Who can survive? Who is it set? Maybe in space? Is it a fiction? Or is it real? Happy! Here we go, here we go, jump up and down, jump up and down, yes. oh, here we go, easy go, easy go, now we can feel that show, with the book, when it is hot, round and round, it's science, humor, adventure, geography, reality, mystery, events, read it, read it, read it, up. Wait those sunshine states, take those baby cats. Ooh. This book's gonna be a good book. Cause this book's gonna be a good book. Hey, I hope you like that because those songs are also on the playlist. And so I hope that you really, really enjoy oh, them. I hope that you really, really enjoy them because they're just so much fun. And so with that, um, <laughs> of course, I want to I want to play something for you, but then there's an ad. I miss you guys. Um, please keep reading. Remember, your assignment is to um, make a spot for you that's a school spot. Take a picture of it and put it in the comments if you can put it in the comments um of this um thingamajigger and again find this and save this so that you can um get back to it later if you have to miss our special show and so with that let's continue with <laughs>
Love you guys. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Hi, everyone. This is Laura. I'm the principal of St. Bernard.